Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, uh, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 414th New Social Environment. I'm Anya, an events assistant here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and the privilege of being your MC today for a conversation between Tomas Schutte and Amanda Gubisi. We're thrilled to have the poet S.J. Goss here, who will re-close today's a few quick notes before we get started. We'd like to start by thanking the Dermot Company for supporting this month of a new social environment as the rail is celebrating its 21st anniversary this October. And you can learn more about the Dermot Company and the rail's curatorial projects at 66 Rockwell through links that I'll post shortly in the chat. At the rail, we open all of our events with two important acknowledgements. The first is that here in New York, we are on the Napehoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. The second is an acknowledgement that Black Lives Matter. The heart of both of these acknowledgements is a commitment to the liberation of the oppressed and solidarity for all who struggle for freedom in recognition that when it comes to liberation, our histories never unfold in isolation as said by the great Angela Davis. In that spirit, I encourage you all to check out the chat uh, for a living document of resources, which I will uh, post shortly. And now to introduce today's guest and host. Artist Thomas Schutte was born in Oldenburg, Germany in 1954 and studied at the Kunstakademie Academy Dusseldorf where he received instruction from Gerard Richter and Daniel Buren. Since the mid 1980s, figuration has been a central concern for the artist. Schutte's work presents what the artist has referred to as the grammar of character, as opposed to a mere representation of the psychological. His current exhibition at Peter Freeman Incorporated is on view through November 6th. And formerly associate professor at Ohio State University, University Amanda Gubizi is the founding co-director of the New Foundation, New Foundation for Art History and the art scene editor for the Brooklyn Rail. She specializes in mid and late 20th century art, design and urbanism in the United States, Europe and Latin America. Amanda is co-author of Art and Design in 1960s New York. Uh, so without further ado, please, Tomas and Amanda, take it away. Great, thank you, Anya. And thank you everyone for being here early or late, <laughs> whichever one is for you. And Tomas, thank you so much for, for being with us and having this conversation with us. Um, Tomas's time is tight today, so I'm going to just get right into the questions. And Anya, I'll ask you just to show the installation images as I start the first question, and then we'll go to slide six after that, okay? Um, Tomas, again, thank you. In this exhibition, you've returned to your explorations of united enemies, which is um, a motif that you've used quite often in your work. At Peter Freeman, they're called Old Friends Revisited, which is a really wonderful way of thinking about united enemies turned to old friends. Could you tell us what's productive about this motif and why do you keep returning to it? Uh, this, just by accident, I cannot... Uh invent myself every second day. So sometimes I have to recycle things. And this happened that on Christmas, uh, I had time to do these puppets and they went extremely the same as uh, uh, 30 years ago. So uh, this came the title from, but the procedure was more or less the same, except um, these little puppets. I show one here. Do you see me? Yes, we really. can, yes. Oh, oh, can you hold it a little bit more? Oh, wonderful. So I made them on Christmas instead of playing Scrabble with my daughter. I was sick at discussing the words. Was was this allowed and not allowed in Scrabble? It was Scrabble Germany, so pretty much the same, but very tough rules. And while I was sick of playing the Scrabble game every evening, so I said, listen, we do things by hand and we could not shop things because of COVID. We could not go to the uh, workshop because of COVID. So I spent the following three weeks uh, making these puppets every, every uh, evening. I made like two to finish all my reserve on 
this plastilin, cooked them the same evening and uh, photographed them, gave them to a, a scanning factory and they make 3D prints and um, plastic molds and then we enlarge them in in uh, in clay and ceramics and this goes on this went on all the year and it's just finished because of these puppets I made 27 different and from time to time I put two together dress them up and send them to several shows and it's nice Normally, it's a repeating yourself, but after 30 years, it's fully okay. I, I like the idea of them being old friends revisited because it, it does permit you then to return to them in a way that isn't repeating yourself. We, we have sometimes the same conversations with old friends and, and every time it's slightly different, right? We have more experience. We have more, more life ways behind us. Anya, could you go to the next slide just so that we can see them a little bit more closely? Um, as, as we can all see, so we have two of the puppets here and they're tied together in kind of these fabulous, um, almost like samurai-esque uh, uh, robes then that are tied with ribbon. Um, in the Peter Freeman show, they have been photographed um, with close-up phot photography. Um, so like a really, really beautiful detail. And I believe Anya, if we go to the next slide, we can see that. Um, so on the left, what um, the FEMO looks like. Um, and on the right, one of, one of Tomas's really, really beautiful sepia-toned photographs. They're, they're not glossy, but they look really, really stunningly glossy. So those are hanging around um, two corners. And then we also have a circle that's been made of some of the enlarged ceramic heads. And they face inward. Um, and I think um, if we go to the next slide, Anya, we can start to see these. We can walk in between them or we can walk around them. And I was curious about this installation for you. Um, the idea that we're, we're kind of enveloped in rotating circles of the old friends revisited. Um, what, what is interesting to you about engaging with architecture this way? My idea was to have them in a circle and uh, it could be never more than five or six or because they're eating each other up or getting too, too weird. But I changed my mind just recently. I made a show, I put 10, like on the street, one left, one right, one left, one right, one left, one right. It's only fully okay. They have to just to come to life and create um, a space in between. And uh, the relation of audience, I cannot control, but if I do them in the circle, they wandering around or they, 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 they are part of the piece somehow because they have to react standing in the middle mm -hmm. and uh, I have problems to identify because I made so many we made about 70 80 of these heads and I can't see them anymore so <laughs> I have a problem what what's coming next but we are working on this uh, not every day but twice a week so uh, but each of this is individual, uh, at least the glazes and the reworking, mm -hmm. because it, they're pretty simple to make. They are like 50 centimeters high or 57, and they all have a mold, a negative mold or a positive mold. And somebody else, an assistant, fills them with clay, and I rework the heads. And we didn't have a single damage in between and not a single failure in glazing because the glazing is pretty delicate. We put two glazes that don't like each other on top of each other and uh, wait for a week. It needs five days to cooling down. And then it's a little bit like Christmas and uh, selecting them how is a good pair. I just do it by chance. I, mm -hmm. I really uh, have problems of memory each one, but uh, the glazing glazes are called snakeskin glaze. Mm -hmm. 
it's a mud and a glossy glaze. And actually I do them in Cologne, which is 25 minutes drive from here. I don't have, uh, this is not my studio, that's my office. The studio is uh, pretty far away from, uh, from my place, uh, not to have the dirt in my, in my home. That's how I do it with factories and they do it very fine. Mm -hmm. um, I've just asked Anya to go back to slide nine, which is um, the, yes, that green head. Is, is this one of the glazes that it's uh, two different glazes that don't like each other very much? Yeah, there's chemical reaction. We have proofs of each glaze. So the, the, the ceramic shop is specialized on art ceramics since I worked there since 33 years. But this two glazes on top, I always did, but not when the glazes don't like each other from the chemix. So there's a, a miracle happening. And from 80 times, it went 80 times well. So. Um, um, Anya, if you could back up one more time. This is this one is um, a particularly beautiful surface. Um, it almost looks like hematite or something like that. And then there's an oil slick green glaze on top of it. Um, Tomas, is this another one of the, the ceramics where the, the two glazes are kind of... No, all of them are... Did. Sometimes it's obvious, sometimes it's not obvious, but they are not fired before. They are raw, dried clay. Mm -hmm. Glaze one time and glaze another time, but by spray gun. So it's a bit... It's oh. not done by hand. It's with this airbrush. Mm -hmm. And what happens, uh, you know, a week later, you don't know. Uh, you never know what's coming out. Oh, so we have Christmas every single uh, weekend. And uh, let's wait what happens in the kiln. So that's fired like uh, more than a thousand degrees for, uh, for three days. And the cooling process is the most difficult. Mm -hmm. It has to be done by computer, so it's even, and we don't have a, not a single one ever cracked through all the years, so uh, we are very lucky. Um, Anya, could you forward to slide 12, I believe? Perfect. Um, Tomas, when I was in the gallery, I was really struck by two different installations that I was thinking of. Um, I have seen pictures of these heads before, but I was realizing that I've, I've not actually interacted with a full exhibition of them. So um, that was kind of lucky anyway, but because they're in a circle, it reminded me of two different displays. Um, one on the left, this atrium of the Altus Museum in, in Berlin, where you stand as a viewer and are surrounded by sculptors who look in on you. And then on the right hand side, this is um, the Messerschmitt installation of his character heads at the Belvedere in Vienna. And here um, they face outward toward you. And, and what you're looking at then are these self portraits of Messerschmitt himself making all of these different faces at you. Your installation is different from these though in that all of the heads are facing inward. And so if a viewer goes inside the circle, she's somewhat trapped in there by all of these heads who are kind of peering into her. What were you hoping for the viewer to, to understand from the sculptors being installed this way? It's me now? Yeah. Yes, please. <laughs> I pretty much don't think in words or uh, slogans or something like this. I more or less let the fingers go their own way and I do them very, very fast, like uh, 30 minutes, 40 minutes each phase and let the fingers speak and I stop when they come to a life, like real characters and hope it transport this feeling that they are real, uh, not really portraits, but uh, that the sculpture comes to life. And this is really fascinating. I've seen the Messerschmitt in the early 80s in Vienna, 
-hmm. the other place in in berlin i i don't remember but i go i'm there in three weeks and have a look okay. <laughs> but circular installations are magical i just was in aachen yesterday which is an hour drive and this was uh uh, the chapel, the dome was octagonal and it's more than 1200 years old. And it's really amazing how a classical things still work. And uh, this was the capital of all Europe when the Charlemagne or Karl the Große, Karl the Great was the, yes. the, the, not the king, the, the emperor. So, um, I have no problems to to like look at all things and revitalize this uh, uh, feeling. But mainly, I'm not so much interested in a single print or a drawing, but in a, in an atmosphere of spaces where people can move or more or less do uh, moving around the things. So. I leave it pretty much to the uh, viewer what he should think. And my message is uh, pretty limited. I love to work with my hands and with material and not so much with media or with technology. I'm uh, a digital idiot. I don't know how to handle all these machines, but uh, sometimes I use them and it makes life sometimes a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. Aachen is interesting because, of course, it is an octagonal space, but of course, it's several stories high. So you're kind of, you feel the bearing of the power of the emperor when you're in this space. And of course, it's, it's extraordinarily highly finished with precious gems and marbles. Your sculptures and, and the Messerschmitts are installed at just below head height for us. Um, if you're tall, like I am, and I assume you are, um, some of them are about, um, you know, about five feet, a little bit higher than five feet. And so they're, they're nearly looking us in the face um, or looking at us in the face if we bend in to see them more closely. They have a, an, an interesting power then that they impose on us even though they're, they're only at our size? No, uh, I think they're double life size because a face is very small. It's only 25 centimeters high, the normal human face. So it's even smaller than a foot, but it looks big because of the movement. And uh, the size is pretty much defined from the size of my fingers. If I make them too small, I have problems. I have to use too many tools and too many wooden pieces. But in this size, I can make them with my thumbs uh, extremely easy and efficient. And they are hollow, not like the Messerschmitt. It's cut from outside, but the, the ceramic heads are hollow inside. So I can slam them on the neck and it, it really moves and uh, has some impact on the on the piece. And I found out the faster I do the things, the better they are at the end. So uh, that's uh, convenient. <laughs> it's very helpful. Yeah, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm pretty lucky uh, to have these people who help me. And, uh, and I don't do them twice. I mean, I do them yeah. in one rush and uh, no <laughs> working. But I get them 90% prepared, so I just do the makeup. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the moment, I'm working on prototypes for casting in glass, which is very interesting, but it's very limited. You cannot f cast a, a full head. And, but there the problem is uh, it shouldn't be eccentric. It should be a beautiful head and a beautiful woman and a beautiful face. And this is much more difficult to do than all these nasty old guys. I mean, it's, uh, it's, I mean, the making of it pretty much defined my work. And this piece is so strange because it's glass, it's cast glass, 
but it doesn't look like glass. It looked like some precious stone, but it's not. It's cast in a mold, and I gave them uh, this piece exactly the same size, and uh, they couldn't blow in fantasy and re uh, reinvent the sculpture, but they it has had a, a shape pretty much than bronze casting, but they had free hand what they can pour inside, either blue or red or both together with bubbles or not bubbles. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, I just came from there, like I was at 10 days ago, and they get gloomy eyes when I told them, you can pour inside what you want, the less it looks like glass, the better it is, because glass is a tricky uh, material because you can't control it. It has its own life. And uh, it's, I have to say 50% is kitsch. And uh, this is a trick uh, to avoid with glass casting and not blowing. You're right about the, the surface of this piece. When I came around the corner, um, uh, for those of us who are listening in the audience, you, you leave the room that has Tomas's circle of heads and you come around the corner and this is the first piece that you see if you go tightly around the corner. I had no idea what the material was. Um, I thought it was maybe alabaster or some sort of marble or something. Um, it's only if we look um, particularly at the neck, um, possibly where it's severed, um, that you can kind of see in this photograph, the sheen on it looks like it could in fact be um, a little bit glassy, um, but it also looks like it could very well be a, a highly, highly polished stone. It's, it's stunning and one that you definitely wanna run your hands over so that you can know, is it, is it scrumbly or not? This is also an interesting piece for me because the, the feel of the neck is so distinctly different from, from your other work. Um, first of all, uh, he or she is, is lying down, um, so lying down on the back, but also then the, the neck is attenuated. And so perhaps this person is just waking up and stretching or, or feeling a moment of ecstasy or something like that. And so I was, I was very curious about this. Can you tell us about the different tone of these glass pieces? Mm, I made two versions. Actually, I did them in uh, ceramic first. Mm -hmm. Always laying because standing ceramic is a bit difficult if it's getting too heavy because yes. it's falling down. And it is hollow, but some are two centimeters thick, some are five centimeters thick. And as I told you, they have free hand. They, at the end of the year, they come with a whole truck with 50 of these pieces. And I, uh, I don't show them too much because they're too precious. And I, I have problems to look at it because it seems like a death mask. Uh, of somebody just dying or just uh, suffering. Mm -hmm. So I have, uh, I don't show them too much and only these two, but uh, the next one will be a face is standing up and not lying down because mm -hmm. every face lying, it's at the end is a dead head. And uh, well, it's the most obvious interpretation you can have. <laughs> Tomas totally in, in, it just anticipated my obvious interpretation. Um, the, the next slide is actually two images of, of art historical works that I was thinking of when I saw these, these heads. Um, on the left, this is the Just brothers um, and the tomb of Louis XII and Anne of Brittany. And it's a very odd tomb. At the top, they're, they're dressed and, and silent and still but below they're nude and Anne is actually taking her last breath and, or perhaps having a, a death throes or something like that. And so she's inhaling and her body is arching back into this sort of ecstatic moment right before she expires. And of course on the right, the ecstasy of St. Teresa here again, this, this long attenuated neck that's actually turning in this nearly impossible curve. Um, how, how will you then display them standing up? Will they need an armature? 
No, they're standing on the on the neck and the, the, they have to cast it from below through the neck. So the neck mm -hmm. is pretty solid. Okay. But I have to tell you, uh, 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 an eccentric piece is much easier to do than a than a relax uh, than a relaxed piece. Uh, these two pieces I don't really remember. Uh, every time I travel, I look at everything that's available, but then I forgot it immediately. And but I don't look at books and what can we do next. I never do this. Mm -hmm. One of the questions well, I, I have, I'm sorry, please go ahead. I'm, I'm only half educated with classical things. And we did the, see the Dürer show yesterday in the last hour of, uh, of the whole show, Albrecht Dürer. And I still don't know what to think about it. Normally you go home and uh, retire and stop it and not continue these foolish things. So. <laughs> the, 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 the classical approach is, uh, yeah, you have to do it anyway. And the story of this is, it was a very nice uh, piece in original. We did a silicone and a plaster mold and uh, it's hollow and uh, we took off the plaster holding of it and the silicone was flexible and we did it two days too early so it collapsed this is not the first this is, uh, uh, and the image was so nice that we uh, repeated this but controlled accidents so we can decide it it drops to the left it drops to the right we blow some air in or get the air out and clean the, it rips off in the neck, but it can be easily uh, repaired. And this is an accident that happens. And at the end, it's the best piece of the whole series because uh, sometimes the accidents are better than uh, uh, the wishing of making a nice head. And, but, um, Basically, what people don't know, the haircut is much more work than the face because the hair is minimum two thirds of a head. And, uh, but for this, I have help. I can give it to hide it to the assistant and say, do the hair, I do the, uh, the, the eyes or the, uh, the neck. So, this is an example that mistakes can be really lucky at the end. This was my favorite piece in the entire show. I, I, I mean, it's clear that it, it must have been a mistake, but I actually then like that it's also been made into a finished piece. It's, it's stunning. And I'm curious too about its relationship to the glass pieces, to the glass heads. Do you, do you feel that they have a conversation with one another? Uh, in this show, yes, because yeah. there's uh, uh, there's always uh, uh, I think there's the same amount of head man head and the same amount of woman head, uh, and then balance with some watercolors. But in glass, the shape is completely defined, and uh, because I try to work in glass, but it can be out of the kiln only for one, two minutes, and then it has to go back in the kiln to not to crack. And uh, I had, if I would have, I would stay three days till it's cooling down, then I see the re result and then it's not polished. And this is much too slow for me. So I, the glass guys only get uh, a really 100% defined thing, except what, uh, out of hundred colors, what they throw inside, and they never never tell you. I mean, it's uh, the maestros say uh, they keep their secret. <laughs> it's it's clear. It's clear. This one is called imploded. Um, so obviously, it's it's shrunk from within, and now we're seeing essentially its its life force is, is has been sucked out of it or something. Um, Anya, if we go back to, I believe. This is called glass me. 
And so I'm curious about this title too. Are you thinking of this as you? Uh, I think it's a remake from 10 years old Keramic. And I had a hard time 10, 12 years ago. And, uh, but I'm not afraid to see myself in these things and then forget it. But it's uh, sometimes titling is a big problem of a, of a bunch of order 20 kilos of material to give them a word and a meaning because journalists try to see the title and not the piece. So sometimes it's a lucky title. Sometimes it's, so uh, I titled them glass me and you, uh, but it's not really clear. I think they came from a, female head that transformed into male but it's ambivalent it's you can't really see uh, 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 really see where it comes from yes these are these are difficult to see as well in the gallery because the plinths that they're on are just a little bit higher and of course since they're lying down it's impossible to get this point of view yeah, 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 yeah. Yourself, yeah. right? I mean, with the camera, yes. But um, Anya, if we go back one, um, basically, when we're looking at them, we can really only look at them essentially like this. So it is, in fact, very hard to read the head of them um, to see: um, Do they have a gender? Are they sleeping? Are they awake? Um, why is the head lying this way on on the plinth? Um, they're so enigmatic and wonderful. Yeah, it comes, I, I have one high of all bases, they are one meter 20 high, and it, I cannot make a base for every single piece, because sometimes it's an addition of 20, 30, 40, and I have to have the same bases. Yeah. Actually, uh, it's not so easy to do this basis, it looks simple, but uh, it's laser cut and very precise, and I use them since, since 10 years. And I have the round ones and the square ones. So uh, one size fits all, perhaps. Uh, <laughs> it's, yeah, uh, it's true. They, they, do, they do read differently, though, with the, the prone sculpture versus the upright sculpture. Um, Tomas hasn't mentioned, too, these are steel bases. So this isn't, um, you know, like plasterboard or something like that or, or um, some other cheap material. These are these are intense, beautiful objects in and of themselves. As you mentioned too, um, the other glass sculpture that's lying down in the gallery is called Glass U. So we have Glass Me and Glass U. Um, you know, if if we're reading the title and reading into the titles, to start to understand that perhaps you're making a portrait of us as, as we're lying, um, expiring or, or perspiring as we think about expiring. And it, it leads me to, to my final question and we'll go to the last slide here, Anya, so that we can see something, something different. Um, tell us about humor in your work. Yeah, it's nice if it's inside or comes out, but, uh... A joke is mostly more uh, clear than a very serious ambition. So I like jokes, and, but it's very difficult to, go, to do good ones. And uh, these watercolors are many, many years old, and I found them back because everything runs fine. The, my foundation, the sculptures, the big bronzes, the market, the buildings, the museums, the shows, the career, everything is fine, except the drawing at night. And uh, I don't do that. I, I did a couple of hundred uh, this year, uh, 2008, 2007. But since then, not really much. And this is uh, actually, I have the time. But if I have a zip of beer or a zip of wine, uh, it feels very good, but the result next morning is disastrous. 
So, uh, and I don't have a subject. So I did so many flowers and portraits and self portraits and hundreds and hundreds of this, uh, of this watercolors, always the same size and everything is ready. So every place I live, uh, there's a desk with the ink, the pens, the pencils, the water, everything is ready to go, but I don't do it. And, uh, I miss this a bit, I have to say. It's a the lyrical uh, stuff of the work and which is, uh, they also done very, mostly very, very fast and sometimes with technical help, not a computer, but a device from the 18th century. It's a camera lucida. Mm -hmm. It's a mirror with a lens and the mirror thing. But, uh, the funny thing about the drawings is you can't force them or you can't lie. It's there. And in this case, it's strange that I pulled the, 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 the leftovers from 13 years ago. And I say, oh no, 13 years later, they are fully okay. So I can hang them on the wall and basically can, uh, uh, can tell a story and I brought them in hand luggage. So, um, uh, I found the, all the concept while installing we were very late with the framers. So I always put a, a man, a male on the left and a woman on the right and an animal in the middle or, a, or a jog or a flower or whatsoever. But, uh, I think uh, humor is essential to these things because it's it's between cartoon and sketch and but pretty much the the reading of the audience is essential and not what I intend. I mean, uh, most of the things is so fleeting images that sometimes I forget immediately what I did and put them on the pile and forget it. Your, your female heads feel very solemn and, and serene to me. The male heads feel, well, some of them are a little scary, I think. Um, but do you, do you think that, they're, that they have a sense of humor? Uh. I don't know, at least show business is uh, entertaining too, and not just uh, messages commanding or trying to, uh, it's not a product show at the end. What, uh, I was pretty happy when the show in New York went so fast and so well, within two days, everything was in and installed. And the most work actually was putting the light on with these little spots. They had uh, hundreds of those and you can define a lot of atmosphere just by simple lightning. Yeah. And the best lightning is which you don't see. So uh, at the end, it was a little bit dim and uh, I liked it a lot because uh, you see real material and uh, surfaces you can't get in polyester and you don't can't get on the screen is this uh, melted glass on a on a beautiful head mm -hmm. tomas is right about that if if you are in new york and haven't yet seen the show at peter freeman please please go and see it um you're right the the lighting is is perfect essentially it's not obtrusive at all it just allows you to see the work which is lovely. Tomas, I am mindful of your time. So I think I'm going to turn the questions over to our participants um, so that they can ask you some questions. Um, and that way you feel confident that you can return to the work at hand. Thank you so okay. much. Okay. Thank you so much, Tomas. Um, we have some questions from the audience. Our first question comes from Maria, Curator Gallery 18. Um, and you should be able to turn on your microphone. 
Yes, hi. Hello. Um, did you want me to ask the question? I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know why I'm unmuted right now. Oh, if you'd like, I can read your question for you. I just saw you had questions in the chat, but if you prefer, yeah. I can. Yes, please do, because I forget what they are okay. <laughs> as we went along. <laughs> Uh, very, very interesting. Um, thank you so much, Thomas, uh, for sharing your, your insights with us. Uh, thank you, Maria. So um, you had a, a few questions, but I think uh, focus on uh, two that are related. Um, Maria asked um, for you to elaborate on the, the idea of glass having a life of its own as opposed to other media. And then also ask uh, the inspiration um, for the uh, glass sculptures, although I feel like we may have um, touched on that a bit. Um, and then also just more of a practical question, wondering if uh, these pieces can be interchanged or if you imagine them as um, able to be interchanged during the installation period. Interchange, what does it mean? Uh, Perhaps the, the idea that, you know, uh, if you have five uh, masks together, do you imagine that you can switch out one mask for another? Um, or are these arrangements done? You know, these, these masks are in conversation with one another. And uh, the, this is very easy. They open the box, pull it out, put it on the plinth, that's done. I cannot spend uh, five hours to say the left is not so well and the green should be with the blue. No, it's absolutely spontaneous. And uh, it seems they all end up in some living rooms in New York, Chicago, whatsoever. And there I have limited control. And that's why the base is so strict, one format. And uh, uh, what they have an afterlife in the home of uh, with silvers from the 16th century or this painting from Andy Wall, I have no idea, but hopefully they survive. I have limited control. I have uh, not a hundred percent control of production, but like 50% because the others is technology and it's limited material and coming to glass, um, it's a crazy guy in Murano who is uh, specialized on casting and uh, talking artists into the glass business, but no artist can do it by himself. And they need the translators and these are the maestros. And I've just seen them blowing a pot of mine. And it's so amazing what these people can do uh, that it's better not to, uh, interfere too much, they are uh, it's absolutely miraculous what they can do. Thank you, Tomas, uh, yeah. for the answers. Uh, our next question will come from G.E. Schwartz. Thank you so much, Anya and, uh, and Amanda, and of course, Tomas, for this wonderful introduction to your work. I, I wasn't that aware of your work before, and I, I just think it's wonderful and gorgeous. Um, that question is, we're talking about maybe not being not being this like classically trained and things like that. You think if, are, are there other sources like music or movies that are more important to um, to your 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 inspiration and and sources and things like that? And if so, which kind of which films and which music? Uh, it's very simple. When I was young, I went to the movies every single day. On Saturdays, I went three times and uh, since I was living alone and on Sundays I went two times it was a cinematic in in many uh, cities and then finally I got kids and I stopped and switched to TV and then I was sick of 30 channels each night and I stopped media completely so I haven't been to the movies since perhaps 12 years uh, I went to the to the animation movies with my kids. It was very funny. But I stopped all this Hollywood uh, 
psychic things, I, I, I could not sleep anymore. And actually, they changed the antenna on my TV, so I have no TV. Uh, even football, I, I don't look, I watch football a lot, but in writing on the news ticker, and that's really amazing that uh, media means less and less to me and uh, except music. Uh, for drawings, actually, Bob Dylan is a very uh, useful record uh, his, uh, when he did dance music, the last, uh, not the blue stuff, but the, in the 90s, the dance records. Because you need, uh, actually need three minutes for a watercolor and three minutes for the cigarette or five minutes for the cigarette. So uh, sometimes I, I uh, still have CDs. I don't stream any little, I don't steal any music. I just, I have to buy them or get them as gift. And uh, I can spend 14 days. Uh, so the last record was the Miles Davis. It was on for two weeks, every single night, like five times. And uh, it's repeating, it's getting richer and richer and richer. But all the other official media, I stopped like books, cinema, theater. I go from time to time, but uh, uh, to have a clear head, I, I don't need entertainment so much. I hope Thank this you so much. Yeah, no, yeah. no, that does. And I love yeah. the fact that your 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 working habits are tying to the music too. That's that's wonderful. Yeah. Thank you for that question. Uh, that was a, a wonderful answer. It's great to hear your process, as as people in the chat are saying. Um, our final uh, question will come from our very own Fong Bui, our publisher uh, and artistic director. Um, Fong, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Anya. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you. Yes. Anna. Thank you. A beautiful show. I saw it the other day. Uh, thank you so much for this talk. I, you know, I was at MoMA just last weekend and I was looking at the Neolin woman sculpture by Wilhelm Lemberg, who also gone to Dusseldorf Academy in the late 19th century. And his works, you know, he, he admired Rodin so much, Thomas, you know, he, uh, I think he straddled between naturalism and expressionism. And I think that's one, one thing of his form but in reference to Rodin, to whom he admires so much, I don't know how correct this story is, but the bust, the plaster of the, the great monumental Bozak sculpture, when it was made into plaster, I think he was not pleased with it. So evidently he took a large slat hammer and he hit the torso, therefore he create a twist in the turn of the, the gesture, the, the torso and the legs, and it gave a new energy, a new twist of energy. The reason I bring this up because I feel your sense of rupture, wherever distortion or other way of describing the form seems to have that similar energy, a twist of energy and it's also in relation to scale. So that's, that's my question. How scale relate to energy through distortion or, or some kind of uh, rupture of the form? Yeah, basically I do models hand size and I let them scan, define the factor and then let it blow up in cutting styrofoam. And then they go up to uh, two meters, three meters, four meters, five meters. And the process of working on it, it's so intense that they immediately get a name. So all the women I made many years ago, they all had a name and they all had a source where they came from. 
And sometimes it's very silly to work in the foundry and five workers watch you and they know how to do it. Uh, they casting the sculpture. And sometimes it's pretty, uh, I don't do it at night with a bottle of wine and hammering this thing, but every second uh, shape defines through frustration after three months, six months modeling, it doesn't really work out and give me the saw and cut it off. And that sometimes they look a bit violent which are not meant. I just wanted to cut the mistakes off. And um, he, he's not much known, Lehmdruck, Wilhelm Lehmdruck, but next door, there's a city to Düsseldorf North. It's a poor city, but it's also a port city. And they have uh, the Lehmdruck Museum, Ooh. which is built by his son in three wings. And they have all the major work because he died pretty early. Uh, actually, uh, he killed himself out of uh, a, a love affair and an unhappy love affair. But uh, he's certainly one of the really good sculptures from this period. And uh, as interesting as Rodin, which I think he uh, did a lot of experimentation and violent physical work mm -hmm. because for a sculpture, uh, the piece is a, is a person. It's not just a lump of material, it's alive. And sometimes you have to hit them pretty hard that they go the right way. <laughs> okay. So, so that sense of violence, does it, does it um, correspond with your own sense of scale? Because I know scale is psychological. Does that make sense at all, Thomas? Yeah, but uh, it's also pretty limited by doors and windows and floor weight and uh, so sometimes a piece gets up to six meters and it's limited by financing because suddenly, so if you have a, a one meter high sculpture, this look cost like $10,000 to do double as much, double as high. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. think it's only $20,000, but it's suddenly it's 200 yeah. because you have to calculate not the, the size, but the surface and the volume, and this increased by uh, 16 times. And suddenly uh, you have to calculate on the cost of it. I see. But so I would never scale, uh, but compared to a tree, to compare to a truck, four meters, it's nearly too small for outside pieces. And uh, this large scale thing, things, uh, I really don't like to do it so much, but from time to time, there's a budget for uh, uh, large scale things, but I basically produce everything by myself mm -hmm. with, the, with the owners of the foundry. And uh, there's nothing else, nobody else involved than me, the foundry and one or two helpers. And public commissions is a bit risky. I, I, I don't like them too much. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm glad to hear that practical side of the matter. Thank you so much, Thomas. So I'm handed it back to Anya for our poetry yeah. reading. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Fong. And thank you, Tomas and Amanda, for this excellent conversation. This has been uh, I, I, so wonderful. And I'm, I'm so excited to go see your show. Uh, this weekend um, up until November 6th at uh, Peter Freeman. Um, at the rail, uh, we have a tradition of uh, ending our community events with a poetry reading. And as, as we come to the close of this event, I'm thrilled to welcome our poet laureate of the day, S.J. Goss, to the stage. Uh, Pakistani American poet and nonfiction writer, S.J. Goss studies how anti-colonial memory, language and abolitionist imagination co-create the possibility of re-earthing for diasporic peoples, inviting us into a belonging that resists the violence of settler colonialism. 
They are a Voices of Our Nation Fellow, a Tin House Workshop graduate, and the winner of the 2020 Vera Meyer Stroop Poetry Prize. They're an MFA candidate at Indiana University, where they currently serve as poetry editor for Indiana Review. Uh, so SJ, the floor is yours to close us out. Hi, all. Thank you so much. Um, thanks for that introduction. And thank you for inviting, to me, inviting me to be part of this conversation. Um, I really loved hearing uh, particularly how, how um, y'all were talking about the work as alive. And I think sometimes you have to give poems a good shove in the right direction too. So <laughs> um, all, of our, all of our art lives, lives on its own too. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna read a couple of poems. Um, forgive me if you hear any background chaos. I got a new kitten and he um, likes to run around a lot. Um, so just, you know. Um, forgive me if there's a little bit of sound in the background, um, but I'll read a few poems which are all part of an examination of my lineage and my family, both of which to me feel pretty elusive um, as my family has experienced displacement uh, many times over generations. Um, so I'm writing through some of these relationships and trying to make sense of how something as present as lineage can simultaneously feel so ephemeral. The first poem has to do with the practice of Unani medicine in the subcontinent. Um, and the next two reference Kavali, which is a, a style of sung poetry, often with divine or religious themes um, in the subcontinent. So just a little context there. Um, so the first poem is called Air, Water, Fire, Earth, Hava, Ma, Nar, Ars. There are four elements to the body and four on earth. This is known to the man, a Hakim, who called to the bedside where he kneels to offer medicine. He is counting on his fingers to find a pulse and hold it, sending his own awareness into the body of the sick. He has brought with him the forest and the field as cure, for he is a man of this world and the next, sensitive as a god to the presence of imbalance. Monsoon in the liver, drought in the blood and the body he knows is a planet of weather. There's nothing wrong with a little weather. He checks the clouds, which look like fish skin papering the heavens and he knows he lives in a body, not his own. It will rain soon. The pulse is quick and pale and his fingers recall a wild hare's child lost from the nest who might live to feed itself and the body of a jackal, who might itself house a baby and the cycle diffuses into a thousand tiny typhoons living on earth, which is a body, not his own. He knows, as the Sufis say, the importance of wa and the wa which threads together all beings. The patient might live should the Hakim arrange his ecology with enough care. He arrives in the sickness, which has leached the deep flesh, which in this case is a landscape cool and strangely dry. He takes his time in the patient's sick earth, touching the plants, withering without their customary dampness. It is a good thing the world is right now a fish, he thinks, and recalls the water gathering in the sky. He will graze the clouds for a mist and the body will come back whole. A river plant will do, and it is a good thing they live in a floodplain, patient and doctor, body and body and body of land. He knows how much medicine to administer, now that he has felt the landscape's particular hunger. Just enough to conjure a rain, and certainly the patient's rabbit heart will calm. He will stay by the body for the night, still to check the pulse and measure its color, to feed it the river plant and guide it towards the nest. Not this time, Jackal, the man prays and wanders the body home. Um, this next one is called um, it is, Footnotes to Reunion. I wish you could have seen me at the first Kavali I ever attended. New Year's in Karachi, my heart rose and rose Upar gulabo, the men and boys singing and singing, their breath rising like thick smoke, their song a kind of resin. 
I wish I could show you the little listening bells in my narrow ears, that bravado of clanging and banging, the stirred up water blanketing my eyes. My skin held dark, the heat sank in me. I wanted to dance and love all the stranger sinews in my body. Yours too, for we live fibrous lives, Khadar winter, Khadi summers, our black hair separating at the root. Every day it's natural to seek absolution, but for me, that's hopeless. I can't cover and kneel without music. Maybe you know how I breathed in the man who stepped up to drop a roll of rupees in the Kaval's basket. We have more than what has been sold to us. You too can have rupees balled in your fist, readying for scatter like the sweat of a dancer at the feet of a poet. You too can twirl your hands like steam, trusting the cold air to hold your song. Um, and I'll, I guess I'll do one more poem. Um, this is called Karana. Right. In the bathroom where the acoustics are reverent, I join the Karana. I listen and sing the prayers and poems, the praying poems, dancing in the small mirrored room, the way I've seen my dad dance once at a wedding in Texas, his brilliant brown arms lifted, chin tilted towards the ceiling, his white gurta crackling with starch, undoing all its tiny locks to allow this one brief flight. Under marigold chains, my dad unfolded a forgotten permission. Visa be damned, even his vest raised itself in wrinkles along his soft shoulders. It didn't last long, but I could hear all the stitches praise. There is a country that hasn't called him back in years. Now far away, I alone watch me tilt and orbit as I learned from him, spin on rocking feet, sing bulisha and wonder how he's doing. We don't talk on his birthday this fall. I haven't sung to him in years, but I remember last winter in the car on a winding highway, I played him Tajdare Haram, which I can't even say without humming, watching his eyes fill before he turned. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, SJ, for that beautiful reading to close us out. And thank you again, Amanda and Tomas, for your conversation today and for all of you who asked questions and contributed to the chat. Uh, you can join us um, tomorrow at 6 p.m. for a conversation between David Sally and Jason Rosenfeld. And now you should be able to turn on your microphones and say thank you and goodbye. Thank you all so much. Like, I reached out to them. Bye bye. Thank you, Thank you Tomas. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, Thank you so much. That was beautiful. Thank, Thank you, Tomas. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. It's beautiful, yes, beautiful. Sure. Gorgeous. Thomas, thank you, Ash. Thank you so much. So Good beautiful. job, Vanya. Congratulations, Tomas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sami. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you. Thank you, Tomas. Make, go see the show, you all. Please go <laughs> see the show this, as much as you can. It's a beautiful show and it's up till November 7, I think. Six. Six. The six, yes. So please make the effort to go see the show. Congratulations on a beautiful show, Tomas. And uh, hopefully we'll see each other soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Yes, for the beautiful Bye. 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 Beautiful afternoon. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you all. Bye. Happy Monday. Happy Monday. Oh, thanks for fighting so fast. Thank you. Ciao. Bye bye.